the glory. Amen. He deserves all the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we lift your holy name. Oh, you deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands. God bless you all. It's good to see you this morning. I mean, let's just bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Father, for the privilege of being here this morning, for yet another opportunity to gather together and lift our voices and sing your praises. God, may we always take advantage of the opportunities that you give to us to glorify your name and to sing of your wonderful mercy and your grace. For every gathering, Lord, to us is a privilege, and every opportunity we have, Lord, we come with expectation to hear from you. And I pray, God, that you would take over, Lord, that you would take control, that you would come yourself and break the bread of life, for you've promised to feed us on your word, and it's your word that we have need of, Lord. God, we pray you would take control and have preeminence, Lord, and may we constantly be yielding unto you a greater preeminence, that you might accomplish your purpose through us in this world, in this hour that we live. For without you, we can do nothing. We ask your blessings over the word now. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's take our Bibles and look at Romans chapter 4 as we get started. Amen. I trust everybody had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Man, I had two really nice days to spend with my family, and so I really appreciated that and value that very much, and we had a good time. Amen. Also, I wanted to let you know that, uh, remind you that Brother Jean Kadima is away ministering today in Pittsburgh, so we remember him today. And also, next weekend, Brother Ben Siebel will be traveling up to Brother Dan Ratliff's in Michigan, near Ann Arbor, and taking a Saturday and a Sunday service. So that'll be December 4th and December 5th. And Brother uh, Dan and the assembly there have got a new church, and they can fit more people. So if some of you want to go up for the Saturday service, you're welcome, and there's room. But don't forget you're where your post of duty is on Sunday. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But that'd be nice if some were able to make it and support Brother Ben and support the church up there. So I just want to remind you of that. Amen. Let's read Romans chapter 4, and then we'll be seated. Romans chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. God bless you as you're seated, and may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. I wanted to uh, just first talk to you for a minute about the email that we sent out. We sent an email letting everybody know that we had had three uh, individuals in the assembly test positive for COVID over the last week. So we just sent that out as information so everybody would have the information they need to make their choice. And so I just wanted to talk about that for a minute. I was speaking with Brother Jeremy Sanders and he said, this is the new norm. And I think we've learned and come to realize that 
COVID wasn't going to be a blip on the map and go away like we thought it was. Amen. It may go away yet. I believe it will, whatever. I don't know what it will do. But anyways, we see waves. We see things go. We see it come. We see numbers reduce, numbers increase. We see variants and mutations and open borders and closed borders. And this is the world we live in, friends. This is the way things are. God has allowed it. But as I reflect on it, I believe God has allowed it for our maturing. Amen. God has allowed it for the perfection of our faith because, you know, we're not able, we are not able to get out of this world yet and we're not able to leave these bodies yet because this is the way life is. And for us, you know, we have a promise, we have a promise of healing, so COVID is not a frightening thing for us on an individual level, but it affects every other facet of our life, amen? For some people, it, is, it becomes very uh, complicated with a work situation, or they may have a, a family member in a nursing home, and you got to get in and out of that nursing home. And to get in and out of the nursing home, you have to answer a questionnaire, you have to have a, uh, your temperature taken, and and you know, I don't think any of us have got such a seared conscience that we can go see grandma and lie every question on the questionnaire, right? So we are affected by these things. We have work situations. We have unbelieving family members that create situations. There's, there's complexity to this issue, amen? This is not just a do we believe God issue. We believe God, amen? Do we fear COVID? No, we don't fear COVID. We've seen God work miraculously for us in this assembly. We've seen God's healing power. The blood that was shed at Calvary is sufficient for all diseases. So we're confident in that, and it's not a lack of confidence, but we do also have to understand the world we live in and the complication that certain individuals have. For some of us, it's no big deal. We're self-employed. We just spend time with each other and our families. We, you know, I mean, if you're a single man who's self-employed, hey, you know, do whatever, you know. But we've got all kinds of intermingling where we mingle out into all kinds of different scenarios. And if, and if we would end up, if, if there's certain ones among us, if we would end up with COVID and we would test positive, it would create a real hardship and a difficulty for us and maybe other people. So as a church, you know, as the Lord leads, we'll just do as the Lord leads. But for me, I feel to continue to go on and have service because we're all exposed to COVID all the time, amen? It's in the community, it's in the grocery stores, it's in the doctor's offices, it's everywhere, amen? And, and not to say that some things may get more serious, we may have to take a different action at a different time. We'll let God lead in that. We don't have all the answers because we don't know all the circumstances. But for me, I just believe we'll continue on and everybody knows their situation. We can't make a decision as a body, we're all going to do this. Those days are over with. This is about an individual walking before God, finding God's leadership in their life. You know your workplace. You know whether you gotta get in and out of that hospital or in and out of that nursing home. You know, I mean, what if you have travel plans? I'll tell you a, a funny story. We were going to Oregon and just a little bit before we went to Oregon, I went to the hospital to visit Brother John Matthews. And John Matthews had COVID. He was in the hospital with a serious case of COVID. And I had to get dressed up like a surgeon going in for surgery. So he put all the equipment on, went in, prayed with him, visited with him, was in there for maybe 20 minutes, left. And we go to take the flight to go to um, Oregon. And there's a questionnaire you know, I, fly, I, fly, I was flying Delta that time in the questionnaire. Have you been in contact with anybody with COVID in the last 10 days? And I had to answer. I'm at a kiosk. I'm answering it for six people. So I'm just in there. Yes, yes, yes. No, no, no. And I do the same thing for everybody. We go to security. We get through the gate. And Brianna goes, Dad, you were in the hospital with John Matthews. I was like, did I lie? It really started bothering me, but thank God I did the math and it had been like 12 or 14 days, amen? Everything was honest, everything was straightforward. And what we realized is God looked after us because we were in post, God's post of duty. We were doing what God called us to do. He looked after us. But you know, something that I wouldn't have been able to do myself is go to that questionnaire and lie and get on that plane because my conscience is too tender for that. Some people have gotten a little bit higher level than me, but, but I'm not there yet. I'm too tender. So, so we realize that these things can be complicated, amen? 
And there's, there's different reasons that some people, have, some people have to be more careful than others for different reasons, amen? And I don't ever want it to become an issue of one believer has more faith than another believer. I hope we're beyond that. Amen. That's nonsense. Because really, this is an individual walk. This isn't about a church walk anymore. This is about me walking before God. And so amen. that's one of those issues where I was in total ignorance, but God already looked after me. God already took care of it. But we can become brash and we can become bold and arrogant and do things anyways, knowing the consequences, knowing that I have to get on that flight and answer those questions, but I'm doing it anyways, I'm, I'm serving God, I'm doing, I don't care about that stupid COVID. You can call it stupid all you want, but spitting at it will not make it go away and won't change the circumstances and won't change the consequences. We can call COVID names, but I don't think it hurts COVID's feelings. We can act, and many times we act arrogantly and we act with bravado and brashness thinking that's faith, and many times that's not faith at all. Faith can be honest. Faith can be honest. Faith can say, this is the situation. This is what they'll ask me. This is the situation. This is what I need to do. I mean, that's mature faith. Childish faith is calling names and spitting and saying, I don't care. That's childish. But God has not called us to be children. This is the bright age where we come to full maturity, rapturing faith in a rapturing condition. We can't play games in a childish way and call names and spit at things and defy authorities and lie on questionnaires. And is that, am I the only one who believes that? So, so for me... It comes down to, to those kind of situations. And we, you know, we've, ha we've heard so many things. All of us over the last two years, we've heard conspiracy theories and ideas and political nonsense. And the news has changed the, the narrative multiple times. Science has changed their mind. And one thing I know is there's uncertainty everywhere and we have no idea what will happen next. But I know God will lead through it all. And I'm confident he'll take care of his children. And we just need to be honest. We need to be responsible. You know, when um, our, our children all had a cold, they've all been suffering with a cold. One by one, they've all got it. But when we heard somebody, somebody in the assembly had COVID, the last one of our children to be sick was Brooke. So I told Angie to take Brooke to get a test, knowing there's consequences for the information. But we can say, we, we can act this way. Ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is bliss, but ignorance is not responsible because I'm not a single man off by myself can skip a week of services and nobody will notice. We, have, we interact with everybody and who we interact with, we can affect their lives in minor ways or in great ways. So we don't have the option. I don't have the option of being ignorant. I have to take the option of being responsible. But thank God her test came back negative. Amen. In fact, she wasn't able to get the rapid test. She got the longer one, and it goes back and it shows if you've had anything in the last 30 to 90 days, and it tests for flu and for COVID, and she's clear of all of it. So once again, God took care of us. God watched out for us. We don't have to pretend and fake and bluff and say God took care of me. We can be honest and let God take care of us. We can be straightforward, honest, and God can take care of us. You know, knowing that if, if that test would have come back positive, we would have had a really difficult situation this morning. I would have had to quarantine for whatever the quarantine period is, missed some services, made other arrangements. It would have been inconvenient for ourselves and many other people. But what if we just decided to ignore that? You say, well, God will take care of it. God always takes care of us. But you know, we understand how the law of gravity works. Does everybody understand how the law of gravity works? So it would, we could climb up to the top of a tower and say, God, I want you to prove that your purpose for me is not finished because the prophet said that you'll never leave this earth till God's uh, uh, purpose for you is finished. I'm jumping off to prove that I'm still in your purpose. Guess what? If your time's not done, God, God will take care of you. You will survive that crash but he also may let you deal with the consequences of falling off of a tower. You may wish you were dead by the time you hit the bottom. 
Because we live in this dimension God placed us here. We can't escape it. We have people with, who've had heart catheterizations, people sitting here with stents. We've had knee replacements, hip replacements, shoulder replacements. We've had cataracts removed. We've had lenses put in our eyes. We've had this, that, and the other. This is the reality, friends. This is where we live. We don't fear any of those things, but you deal with them. We live here. This is the world we deal with. So we can climb up to the top of the tower, jump off and say, I'm going to prove that God's purpose for me is not done. If he's not done, you'll survive. But God may let you limp the rest of your life as a reminder that you don't tempt God. We're going to be honest. So as we move forward, we don't know what will happen. We don't know what another wave, another cycle. We don't know what a uh, new strain might do. But we know we work with people who are frightened. We know we live in a world that's complex. And we know whatever challenge we have to face, we can face them with honesty, responsibility, faith, and integrity. And the very life of God can be on display. And there's nothing that we have to fear. So we don't have to fake We don't have to bluff. We don't have to pretend. That's not faith. Faith is dealing with the circumstances as they are and dealing with the reality as it is. And so I I pray that God brings us to that level of maturity. For instance, the Sharibi family is leaving in a little over a week to go back to Uganda to visit their family. It's an important trip for them. They've been gone from home for a long time. Their family has grown since they're gone. They want to go back and see all the parents, the aunts, the uncles, the cousins, and all of that. Amen. But but you know, they live in a world, there's a reality to this world, and they know that if something happens, they could jeopardize that trip. It's not a fear of COVID. It's the reality of the circumstances that COVID has created. Amen. Amen. You know, many of us, if we haven't yet, many of us are going to have to face a vaccination mandate one way or another. Many have already faced it. Many are in the process of work, you know, coming up with the rules and figuring out what they're going to do. That is an individual decision that you have to find the leadership of God on. Nobody can tell you to do it. Nobody can tell you not to do it. You have to ask the Lord, what should we do? Many have already had the vaccination. Many will yet get it. There's, there's folks who have family that live in Canada. If they want to see their family, they have to have a vaccine. You can call COVID stupid all you want, but if you're going to go see your family, you have to have a vaccine. That's the law of the land. So we, we have to deal with the situation and ask God, what do you want gone? People say, I'm not afraid of COVID, but you're afraid of a vaccine. So you're still afraid. At the end of the day, you're still motivated by fear. I say, let faith lead the way, amen? Amen. The way God leads me, what I'm comfortable with, I don't feel checked in my spirit. I know this is my God's leading for me. Just let God lead, amen? And let God lead everybody else. I hope that we can come to a level of maturity where one person can say, I feel like God led me to get the vaccine and stay in the job I'm at and not quit my job because I feel like God put me there supernaturally and hasn't told me to leave. And they're requiring this or I lose my employment. I've prayed about it and God hasn't given me the green light to quit. So I'm going to submit to the master that I'm under. And the next person can say, God led me not to do that. I'm going to quit and get another job. And can we come to a level of maturity where we can say they are both right? That your decision does not cause me to doubt my decision. And my decision shouldn't cause you to doubt your decision. That we've come to a level of individual maturity and faith before God. That I can do as God leads me. You can do as God leads you. And we can both say, God bless you. I think you're right. So as we move forward, we just continue to have church as much as possible unless God leads another way. And everybody will have to decide what they need to do based off their situation. And so God just bless you and God keep feeding us. Hey, God's been taking care of us, amen? Amen. We've got many, many testimonies of supernatural deliverance and God really taking care of us for us to fear anything. So let's just move forward in faith and let God lead. When... uh, Brother Kyle called me yesterday to let me know that Carrie had tested positive. She had just had a cold, but all of a sudden she lost her sense of taste and smell. So they went in and got a test immediately. And then I had already started on my notes. He called me 
midday yesterday, and I'd already started on my notes, and I looked down at my title, and the title was The Maturing of Abraham's Faith. I said, God, this is for the maturing of our faith. Amen. God is using all circumstances to really get us to grow up. Amen. We thought we were mature, but we look back and we say, that was childish. Amen. And right now we may feel all big and grown up. My question is, how will we feel 10 years from now if there's a 10 years from now? I say, God, I need you every hour to lead me and to mature me. So we, we've been preaching before the meetings on the seed of, the seed of promise, the seed of Abraham, and things like that. I thought that the meeting... I thought that the meetings would break my chain of inspiration. I'd go to something different after the meetings, but I was wrong, amen? So we're going to pick up and, and look at Abraham, but for a title, I titled the, this The Maturing of Abraham's Faith, and I just in the Bible study want to follow along through the life of Abraham and watch how God brings Abraham through, amen, and brings him to, to what I would say is a level of perfect faith, and I want to look at that today. We know that Abraham, we read here in Romans chapter 4, verse 16, that Abraham is the father of faith for us. Amen. And we who have the faith of Abraham are the seed of Abraham. So we're following in Abraham's footsteps. So we want to take the nature of the father of faith. Amen. We want to be children of faith. So we want to look at Abraham's faith. Brother Branham says in the message, the patriarch Abraham he said, we're facing now a grand text tonight, the patriarch Abraham, which was called the father of the faith, because that God made him the promise to inherit the earth and his seed. And it's through Abraham, we being dead in Christ, become Abraham's seed and our heirs with him according to the promise. So we, he is the father of the faith. We're the seed of Abraham. We're children by faith. I want to look at Ephesians before we move any further. Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Amen. I titled this The Maturing of Abraham's Faith. But I didn't know what else to title it. But we know Abraham's faith was a faith that God gave him, amen? And we know that if we have faith, our faith is a gift from God, amen? But so when I talk about the maturing of faith, when God gives faith, amen, that's, that's sufficient. So when I talk about the maturing of faith, that's only from our perspective. But, but really what I'm talking about is God, amen, getting more of Abraham out of the way so that that faith can be expressed, amen? So the maturing of our faith is really the changing in our attitude and, and, and changing in our reaction and the way we deal with situations to leave ourselves out of it so that that faith can be expressed, amen? So when God gave faith, he already gave us a mature faith. But it's shrouded in this body, amen, and underneath this intellect and this mind, reasoning and all the senses that we have. And we, we learn as we go how to deny thought, how to deny emotion, how to deny our eyesight and the circumstances to let this faith really take the lead, amen. And so that's what we're, we're looking at and talking about this morning. Let's go to Genesis chapter 11, and we'll begin back here in Genesis and stay here primarily Genesis chapter 11, verse 31. When we, when we got that uh, COVID test and it came back negative, I said, huh, you can still have a cold. <laughs> I didn't realize it was possible still to get a cold. So we know, I know of about four people who have had that cold and got tested and got negative results, so there's a cold going around too. But I thought, it's amazing, we have proof. You can still have a cold. <laughs> Not everything is COVID, praise God. The old sicknesses are back, amen? <laughs> I never thought we'd be happy about that. Amen. God is good, friends. God is good. Genesis chapter 11, verse 31. And Terah took Abraham his son and Lot the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, 
And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan, and they came into Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. I want, you to, the, I want you to look at this scripture, and it says, Terah, which was Abraham's father, took Abraham, his son, and Lot, and their spouses, and they went from Ur uh, unto Haran. Now, this is really important as we move on, because you'll find that, that um, they're making a move, and this move is critical to God's calling for Abraham, but the Bible says that Terah took them and went. Terah was still in the lead. Terah was still the father. He was still making the decision, amen? But then, while they're in Haran, Terah died, right? So let's look at chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Brother Benham takes the scripture and he shows us that God had called him before, not in Haran, but when he was in Ur, God had called him and told him to separate. He said, get out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. So God, when he, not here in Haran, but God, now the Lord had said unto Abram, he's talking about something he told Abraham previously. So when Abraham was in Ur, because this is what the prophet tells us, that he called him while he was in Ur, and he told him, leave your country, leave your kinfolk, leave your father's house, and come to a place where I call you. Amen? And we know that Abraham believed that. Is that true? God told us Abraham, he had a gift of faith, and when Abraham heard the voice of God, he believed God was calling him to leave and to go to this land, amen? But the initial action showed that there was still a lot of Abraham mixed in and overshrouding this faith because he believed the word of the Lord, and he must, and this is just me, he must have shared that with his father. Hey, father, you know, we've got to go. I'm, I've got to go. And his father said, okay, let's go. And Tara, still in the lead, amen, takes Abraham, and Abram at this time, and his wife, and Lot, and all their possessions, and they move up to Haran because they're moving up out of Mesopotamia, up north to cross over, amen, into the promised land. So now Terah is taking the lead. It's not that Abraham doesn't believe the word of God, amen, but Abraham, he, he, it, it's still working out, right? We're still going in that direction. I know God said leave, 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 but, but dad wants to go too. It's okay, right? The reason I say it this way is because when we look back on our lives, this is exactly how our lives go. We believed the word of the Lord. When we heard the message, we believed it, amen, but, but we reacted to it in such an immature way, amen, but God, through time, is developing Abraham and bringing Abraham into his word and into his promise and dealing with all Abraham's situations until the word is completely confirmed, amen, and, and Abraham comes into the reality of that word. So now, I'll read it again. The Lord had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that cursed thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. Now the initial call was to separate from country, kinfolk, father's house. But we know then, after that commission, Terah takes him to Haran. But in God's grace, in God's mercy, in God watching over his promise, he allows Terah to die. That wasn't an act of Abraham's tremendous faith. That was God, amen, bringing about his own word in Abraham's life. That was God being true to his promise. That was God being merciful to Abraham. That was God watching over his word. That was not a result of Abraham's tremendous faith, although Abraham believed the word of God from the very beginning. How many of you can look back over your life and say, I believe the message when I heard it? But I carried a lot of nonsense with me for a long time. But by God's grace, he would, bring, he would begin to remove nonsense from me, amen? 
Different relationships would fade away. Amen. Churches would break up. People would go different directions. <clears throat> it wasn't your tremendous faith that made all of that happen. It was the mercy of God to keep his promise to you and keep moving you into the word of God. So we watch how God's dealing with Abraham because we're the children of faith and the way that God deals with the father of faith is how he's dealing with the children of faith and we can have confidence in one thing, that I'm saved by grace. Amen. Through faith and that not on myself, it is the gift of God. I've done a lot of things, amen, that I realize now weren't according to that faith, amen, but I still believe God and God still worked it out. You know, when, when the scripture says in verse 1, now the Lord had said unto Abram, amen, it gives us no prerequisite condition on Abraham's part. God did not say because Abraham was found righteous. God did not say because he was a good man. This is pure, raw election. Brother Branham says their family was still caught up in idolatry that took place in Babylon. And the family, Terah, came down from Babylon and brought the family from Babylon to Ur and, and brought many of those practices from Babylon to Ur. God was calling Abraham out of heathenistic, uh, 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 heathenistic paganistic, multi-God religion. And Abraham was raised in this. He was stuck in this. And God was not calling Abraham because Abraham had merit. He was not calling Abraham because of conduct. He was calling Abraham because of the election he had before the foundation of the world. He was to somebody who's just like everybody else. Amen. And he says, you. You're the one. Get thee out of this land, leave the country, leave thy kindred, leave thy father's house, and I'm going to make out of you a great nation, and everybody that blesses you will be blessed, and everybody that curses you will be cursed, and all the nations of the world will be blessed in thee. Can you imagine Abraham? What did I do? Is like Mary. When the Virgin Mary, she's going to the well to fetch water like she did every day. She's a spouse to a man to be married. She's as common as common can be. And all of a sudden, an angel shows up and says, hey, thou blessed, highly favored of the Lord. It's like Gideon. Gideon is behind. He's hiding behind the wine press, threshing out wheat, amen, because the, the Philistines are the, uh, uh, keep coming and taking their wheat, amen, and an angel shows up and said, behold, thou mighty man of valor. Mighty man of valor was hiding behind a wine press, threshing out a little wheat to hide it, amen, from the, from the Canaanites so that they wouldn't take it from them. He didn't know he was a mighty man of valor. Mary didn't know she was highly favored of the Lord. Abraham didn't know he was chosen to be the father of faith. Neither did you and I know. Amen, when we started our journey in this life, we didn't know that we were the seed of Abraham. We didn't know that we were the children of God, elect and foreknown before the foundation of the world. But God came to us in whatever condition he found us in. And whatever condition he found us in, he come to us and said, you're one of them. And then there was something in us that believed what we heard. Just like there was something in Abraham that could believe what God told him, there was something in us that believed what we heard, and now we were believers. Now, Abraham, <coughs> from that point on, was a believer. But Abraham did conduct did not always demonstrate that he believed what God told him. Do you agree with me? He told Abraham, leave your father's house, leave your kindred, leave your country. And all of a sudden, Terah says, okay, good idea, boy, let's go. And what's Abraham going to do? This is his father. He, he knows what God said, but now his father's dragging him along. And, and can you imagine the pickle he was in? Many of us have been in pickles before. Everybody's going this way, but God wants us to go this way. We don't know what to do. And sometimes we've allowed that to sweep us into something we shouldn't have got swept into. But somewhere along the line, God in his mercy broke that thing apart so that we could get back to where he wanted us to be. This 
When we talk about the faith of Abraham, amen, we're not talking about Abraham being a, 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 a giant of faith of his own will, of his own mind. We're talking about a man who, who God had planted a seed of faith. God come and called. God instructed. God watched over. God protected. God moved. God changed circumstances. God did it all. He gave him the promise, then God kept his own promise. Even when Abraham wasn't doing a thorough job, God still kept his promise to Abraham. Brother Branham said this was the unconditional promise, amen? God had made conditional promises to Abraham. He broke it. To Noah, broke it. Amen? Promises were broke, were broke, were broke. So God says, I will make you the a great nation. I, all the families of the world will be blessed in thee. He never said, if you do, I will. He said, I'm going to do this. You're the one, and this is what I will do. And from that point on, God was with Abraham, making sure that what God promised, God was going to do. And as Abraham worked through this life and through these circumstances and situations kept changing, Abraham kept releasing more, amen, to the promise, more to the word of God, and less to his own thinking. Amen. Let's keep going. Now, he says, I want to catch this in verse 4. So Abram departed. That's what God told him to do. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. That was what was not supposed to happen. He told him to separate from his kindred and his father's house. And so now he goes, and Lot went with him. <clears throat> and you can imagine, Abram, Abram, he says, oh, I'm doing what God told me to do. Now, now listen, this is so easy for us to do. I'm doing what God said. I'm going to a strange land. I'm leaving mine going to a strange land. And Lot decided to come along. But it wasn't full obedience to the word of God. Brother Mem told us it wasn't full obedience to the word of God. So he goes, <clears throat> and Brother Branham says this in Jehovah Jireh from 1958. He said, I want you to notice Abraham coming down out of Babylon with his father and dwelt in the land of Shinar and perhaps had his living there. His wife was Sarah, his half-sister. Now, he was 75 years old and Sarah was 65 years old before God ever spoke to him and made the covenant with him. 65-year-old woman, 75-year-old man, and God said, walk before me and be perfect. God made the covenant with Abraham unconditionally. Wasn't any conditions. If you do this, I'll do. He made a covenant with a man once like that, Adam, and he broke him. Man breaks his promise, God can't break his promise. <clears throat> God determined to save man. He made the covenant to Abraham unconditionally. He told him, I've done this, and it's going to be this way. This is going to be, and you're coming to me at an old age. So God gives the promise. God's going to keep the promise. Abraham's the one. Nobody else will become the one. So God has got to get Abraham in the condition. Listen, there's nobody else. There's, there's nobody else that's going to fulfill this promise but us. There's going to be a change in the body and the completion of a rapture that's going to take place. There's going to be people who change from this dimension to that dimension and have their atoms change in their body. Who else is going to do that? Who will we leave it to? God has called us. Then if God has called us, and that's the promise for this hour, and that's why the seals were open, and that's why the uh, thunder sounded to give us rapturing faith, amen, then who else will do it? We'll do it. How are we going to do it? We can't do it, amen. He has to do it through us. <clears throat> and everything that's standing in the way of that fulfillment, one by one, God works us through and brings us through and moves it out of the way. What's he doing? Increasing our faith. Really, it's not increasing our faith. He's decreasing our self. We are decreasing so that that faith he's already placed in us is increasing. So that life of himself that's already there will have greater expression. So I believe Abraham was learning not to trust himself. I think Abraham was learning not to have confidence in himself. So we know Abraham leaves, he travels over 
to the land that God told him, and he gets in the land, he's still not in full obedience because Lot has come with him, and now Lot's a tag along, and he's brought Lot into the promised land with him. He's still not in full obedience, but look what happens here in verse 6, chapter 12, verse 6. <clears throat> and Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sechem, unto the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Now, as Abraham is beginning in his journey, <clears throat> he believes God. Does anybody doubt Abraham believes God? Abraham is not an unbeliever. Abraham is a believer, but he's not in full obedience. He's in partial obedience because Lot comes with him. But as soon as even in partial obedience, he makes a step towards God, God appears to him anyways and confirms the promise. I want to ask you, have you always been in full obedience to this word? And when you realize looking back, I was not always... Was God still dealing with you or did he quit dealing with you? Did God still come and inject himself supernaturally in his life? Did he still speak to you? Did he, still, did he still make a way for you? Did he still heal you? Did he still deliver you? Did he still come and appear himself before you? Amen. Did he still open the word to you? You look back and say, I was in partial obedience, but he was still there because you were making steps in the right direction and he as a father was guiding you along. Amen. God understands us. God understands where we are. God's made a promise, and he will get to that promise, and nothing will stop him from getting to that promise. And God is not just going to sit back and say, hey, buddy, you're on your own. Amen. We, every, every, listen, every time Abraham made a step towards God in the promise, God showed up and talked to him. God dealt with him. God delivered him. God brought him further along in the journey. Amen. Because God said, this is the one. This is the promise. It will happen. And for us, God says, you're the one, this is the promise, it will happen. When we were, when we were in our walk and in our immaturity and in, the, and in the stages that we went through, God was working with us all along, bringing us from one situation to the next situation, delivering us from one obstacle and another obstacle and opening more to us along the way. And what has been happening, amen, our faith has been increasing, amen, our confidence in God has been growing, our understanding of who we are, our understanding of the promise, it's been growing all along. Amen. Brother Benham says in the message of grace, we'll call another character where God's grace was extended, many of them. We'll just speak of a few. Abram, Abraham, Abraham, no special man, came down from the Tower of Babel, perhaps come out of an idolater bunch. His father come down in the land of Shinar, down there to dwell in the city of Ur. And while he was there, God spoke to him by grace, not because he was different, not because he was a better man, but by grace God called him. The Bible clearly makes that known. Oh, Abraham, how Abraham tested God's patience. I love that statement, amen? That statement is really for us to get understanding. I don't know that God's patience can be tested. I'm not sure. But he said, oh, Abram, how Abraham tested God's patience. Told him, said, Abraham, stay in this land. Don't you go out of it. But as soon as famine come, Abraham run. So, so Brother Branham describes it to us like this. God called Abraham. Nobody else was going to be called. God's watching over Abraham. But Abraham sometimes, amen, Brother Branham says, he tested God's patience. Oh, friends, look back on your life. Do you ever look back and say, oh, is there any place you look back in your life as you walk as a believer and say, oh, God, I'm sorry. Amen. If Abraham tested God's patience, what about you and I? But we found out there's no limit to God's patience. There's no end to his mercy. There's no cutting off of his grace. Amen. When he's dealing with his children. Let's go to Genesis 12 and 10 and look at this that, that Brother Bram talks about. Genesis 12 and 10, and there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass when he was near, come near into the Egypt that he said unto Sarah his wife, Behold, now I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. 
Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee that they shall say this is his wife and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. I want to take a look at this and focus our attention on this scripture and look at this stage in Abraham's journey. This stage in Abraham's journey, Abraham is still trying to save himself. Abraham is trying to save his life because of his wife, and he's trying to save his life because of famine. God told him, Brother Abraham tells us over and over, God told him to go to this land and stay in this land. He wasn't supposed to leave the land, amen? But when hardship come, when a trial came, Abraham didn't stick with what God said. Abraham used his own reasoning, and with his own reasoning, he said, if we stay here, we'll starve. And he runs down to Egypt because Egypt has bread. So Abraham is trying to save his own life. I say this self-preservation is a sign of immature faith. You say, what else would a man do? I don't know what else would a man would do, but just stay with God's word and say, God, you told me to stay in this land. There's nothing here. You have to provide. And God proved that he could because the, uh, the next generation, when Isaac comes on the scene, Isaac goes down to Gerar right on the border of Egypt, and he's about to cross into Egypt for the same reason, because there's a famine. And God tells Isaac, he says, do not go down into Egypt because there was a famine. And it's the same passage where he says he planted, amen, in the time of famine, he planted in this famine season, and God gave him a bountiful harvest of a hundred times more. So God proved in the next generation down what he could do if somebody would stay where God said stay and do what God said do. Amen, you don't need reasoning, you need the word of God. We don't need logic, we don't need self-preservation. We, we need to sacrifice ourselves completely and let the word take dominion. Abraham in his walk was still preserving himself. Amen, we're gonna stay here, we're gonna die. God said, Isaac, you stay here and don't leave. Isaac planted and he reaped 100% or a bountiful 100 times more. Everybody else was hungry. Isaac had more than enough. Why did Isaac have more than enough? Because he's a better farmer. Obviously, he knows how to put the seed in. He, he's got irrigation. He's a better, he, he did better because he obeyed God. God said, don't go, he stayed. So God's proving what can be done if we stay with his word. So you say, how do you blame him? As a man, I don't blame him. Amen. As a man who uses reasoning and logic, and that's the reasonable, logical thing to do. Obviously, if his wife's very fair, he knows how things work in that day. Amen. They, they'll, they'll kill me to take her. So logically, he comes up with a plan to protect himself. Right? But God comes down on the scene and shows that I can protect everybody. Because when Pharaoh's going to take Sarah, amen, he comes down and protects Sarah, and protects that womb because that's part of the promise. See, friends, what Abraham was learning was to take God at his word and not add any thinking to it, just to take God at his word. <clears throat> Let's go over here to chapter 13. I'm just going to take it in order, and we're just going to march along in order. <clears throat> Chapter 13, verse 5. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks, had herds, had tents. And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the, and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram saith unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. I'm going to stop right there for a minute. God is in every detail. When Abram, when Abram went down into Egypt and he had this thing, he left the land. He wasn't supposed to leave the land. Amen. God preserved him. He wasn't supposed to do all that. But because of the situation, amen, Pharaoh greatly increased the riches of Abraham so that when they come out of Egypt, now Abraham is rich. You say, man, God is good. Even in his mistake, he makes him rich. And I say, yeah, it's good to be a son of God. But why did God give him all of these riches? Amen. In the next verse, he and Lot now have so much, they can't live together anymore. 
Why is it that they can't live together anymore? Because God said separate from your kindred. So God is going to work a circumstance that's going to cause separation. How did God work the circumstance to bring separation? He blessed them so abundantly that they could no longer live together. God is watching over his word. God is watching over his child. So let's separate, he says. Verse 9, is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. If thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes, and behold, all the plain of Jordan, and it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of God like the land of Egypt, as thou comest out of Zohar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated. Catch this. God's going to come and speak to Abraham after Lot separated. How did God get Lot separated? God worked the plan. God worked the circumstances to do what Abraham wasn't able to do of his own self-will. God created a circumstance to help the situation along. And when they finally separated from one another, God comes to speak to Abraham again. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that a man can number the dust of the earth. Then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land and the length of it, and the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee." Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. I say, praise God, the grace of God, amen? Abram, he, he knew the word of God, amen, but God, amen, first he allows Terah to die to keep the word. This is not Abraham's great faith in action moving things. It's God moving according to his word. Then he brings Lot along, and they get into these situations, but God brings, brings something along that'll help Abraham to do what Abraham hasn't yet done of his own accord, and it brings a separation. But as soon as there's a separation, God's not coming down in great wrath and punishment upon Abraham. He appears to Abraham to once again confirm the promise to him. See, for God, amen, God is keeping his word. For God, it's about the promise. God is keeping his word. Let's keep our place here in Genesis. Keep your hand in Genesis, but turn with me to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. So far, we are reading about Abraham moving and God's calling and God's commission. And we know what Brother Branham said, that God could never really bless Abraham until he completely separated. But we see how that complete separation came. Not by the will of Abraham, but by the mercies of God. But let's look in Hebrews chapter 11, verse eight. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in a strange land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. I'm so thankful for the account in Hebrews because the account in Hebrews, to me, is the heavenly account. When you just read Hebrews and you don't read Genesis, you're like, Abraham was a great man. By faith he left this land. By faith he did this. By faith, and he was looking for a city. All of those things are 100% true. By faith, he left his home. By faith, he sojourned in a strange land. By faith, amen. But the Bible's not listing that he didn't fully obey because he took Lot along. He didn't fully obey because of his father. He didn't, he didn't fully obey because he left the land. It's only looking at what Abraham believed, and Abraham believed the promise even if his actions were missteps. 
Even if for a little bit he stepped to the right, God will bring him back. He stepped to the left, God will bring him back. But the heavenly record only looks at what Abraham believed. And all along, Abraham believed the word of God. He believed what God said. He believed the promise of God. He did obey. He did walk. Amen. And where he was lacking, God was working out the details. I hope that there's just a heavenly account of my life and says he believed the message of the hour. He stood fast with the word of God. He believed what the prophet said. Amen. Because I can look back on my life and say, I believed, but I still did that. I believed, but I allowed that compromise. I believed, but I still went along with this even though I knew it wasn't right. Amen. I want all those things erased from my records. I want a Hebrew account of my life. Amen. That says he believed the message. When he heard it, he believed it. He walked out of his denomination and he walked into the promise of God and he believed the message and left his home and left all of this and left relationships. That's the heavenly account. The reality was I prayed tearsful in my pillow saying, God, please don't let me be rejected by my family. God, if I could stay here and win them over. God, if I could just stay in the church and change the church. The earthly account and the heavenly account are looking at two different pictures. The earthly account is looking at my actions. The heavenly account's looking at my faith. Because there was something in me to believe the word, but I needed child training to be able to stand on that word. And God, God brought separations in my life. It wasn't me standing up at a family reunion. <laughs> God has called me into the message of the hour. And I'm leaving you behind. Like. It was a, a, a human being, scared and trembling and not, not knowing how to handle all the situations that were around me. But God was looking at a faith seat in there and a promise that he had and a plan he had before the foundation of the world. And God said, I'll take care of all these situations. I'll bring conflict and separation and I'll bring this and I'll bring that and I'll get them into the right place. Oh, I love the life of Abraham because I look back and say the same God that led Abraham is the same God who's led me. The same God who took care of Abraham's deficiency is the same God who took care of my deficiencies. The same one who corrected Abraham's misstep is the same one who's corrected my misstep. Amen. I'm following in the path of Abraham, my father in faith. Yes. Hebrews says, Abraham believed. By faith, he left his own. Absolutely. That's nothing but the truth. Abraham always believed it. But he just didn't always have all the actions right. But he always believed it. In the message forsaking all from 1962, he said, and God never did place Abraham until he totally obeyed him. Abraham wanted to take his daddy along, and the old man was a fly in the ointment all the time. Finally, he died. Then Lot, there was strife and everything. And then as soon as Abraham fully obeyed God and separated himself and let Lot go on down there in the good lands, wherever he wanted to go, down in Sodom, then God appeared to Abraham and said, lift up your eyes. I give the whole thing to you. Abraham was the one who separated. He was the one who separated all to follow, to follow God. And he is the father of faith. He is the one that we believe to be the faithful one. The promise was made to Abraham and his seed. We being dead in Christ or Abraham's seed heirs with him according to the promise. If God could do what he did for Abraham, why can't we let God do it for us? Amen. If, if God could take care of all these situations for Abraham to keep moving him in the promise, why can't we let our past be God taking care of all these situations and move us into the promise? Instead of cringing over every misstep, why can't we just thank God? God, thank you. When I couldn't, you could, amen? When I was failing, you weren't failing. When I had small vision, you had big vision. You know, sometimes I, I, I think this is just me pondering again that Abraham wanted to take care of Lot. Abraham's father took care of Lot when Lot's father died. And now Abraham's taking care of Lot when, when Lot's grandpa dies. And I think he wanted to take care of Lot. I, I, I don't know this for sure, but this is just being a human being. Lot's a family member whose father died, grandfather died, 
Abraham really has been looking after him. And no doubt Abraham just wants to take care of him, watch over him, but God said separate from all. So God even understands that part of Abraham. God even understands that desire in Abraham. And we see that desire never went away. God brought the circumstances for separation. When there was separation, they separated. God confirmed the promise. But then Lot down in Sodom, amen, got in trouble. And Brother Branham said, whenever you separate from the believers, you get in trouble. Down in Sodom, he got in trouble, and kings come in and took him away. And who was fit to rescue the whole thing? It was the one who was separated, was fit to bring the rescue. Sometimes we think non-separation is how we take care of people, not understanding that sometimes separation is the way we take care of people. Remember when God was going to go down and he was going to destroy Sodom and he reveals it to Abraham and Abraham begins a series of intercession. Amen. Who is Abraham worried about most down in Sodom? Abraham is worried about Lot down in Sodom. So he is interceding with God saying, God, would you surely the God of all the earth, the righteous judge wouldn't destroy the righteous with the wicked. What if you find 50? And he begins to, what's he doing? This shows that Abraham still had a desire to take care of Lot. Abraham didn't hate Lot. That wasn't what the separation was about. Abraham wasn't tired of Lot. That's not what the separation was about. The separation was the separation for the word. But because he was separated unto God, he could intercede to God on behalf of Lot, who was stuck down in Sodom. Sometimes we're afraid of separation, and separation sometimes is the very thing that gives us intercession, gives us an audience with God. And God is mindful of these things. God, God didn't hate Lot. He didn't rip him away and destroy him. God just brought a separation. But Abraham was still mindful of Lot. When he got caught up and got carried away, I mean, I don't believe Abraham got caught up in every battle and war that ever took place. But this one involved his nephew and his nieces. And he went and rescued them and brought them all back. When he did that, who did he meet on the way back? But Melchizedek, the high priest of God. Why would God show up in such a tangible way, amen, to take care of Abraham? Because uh, to, this is just Brother Chad again. I believe that what Abraham did pleased God. So we have to understand our separation is not, I hate these people. They're bad influences on me. I'm not going to have anything to do with them. I'm separating to the word, and I stay separated by the word, but my heart is still there. God, can you help them? God, can you deliver them? Hey, don't be afraid to go pray for somebody in the hospital when they're sick. They don't have to be a believer. You can go fight the army of Cheddar Lamore and you can go into the hospital and lay hands on somebody. If they can believe you, amen, they can be healed. Amen. Don't be afraid to fight for those that we've even had to separate over the word. We know, mindful, we know God is mindful of these things. Because God says, God says, when he delivers Lot, it said, God remembered Abraham and delivered Lot. You know, the best thing that we can do for our family who don't believers, the best thing we can do for others is to give ourselves completely to the word of God and obey everything he says. That's what, when, when Abraham and Lot separated, Abraham was still looking out for Lot, and Abraham was still interceding for Lot, and God was mindful of them. Let's go to Genesis chapter 15. After the battle, after he delivers back Lot and all of Sodom, he meets Melchizedek. Melchizedek serves him communion. He pays tithes to Melchizedek. Amen. Then Sodom, uh, the, the king of Sodom offers to let him keep all the spoils, and he won't do it. He says, because I will not. I've swore, I've raised my hand to the God of heaven, and I will not take anything lest you say you've made me rich. And after that, it says, 
chapter 15, verse 1, after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision saying, fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, why did God say that? Because Abram wouldn't take any of the spoil and said, God is one who makes me wealthy, not you. I don't need anything you have. All I need is God. I want to ask you, at this stage of the journey, do you think Abraham is starting to mature in his faith? You think Abraham's starting to realize some things, amen? I believe he's starting to realize some things. He said, I'm not taking anything unless you get credit for making me rich. I've swore to God I'm not going to take it all. I'm trusting in God. And God comes on and says, I'm your shield and exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, what will thou give me seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thy heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward the heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. I'd like to continue saying, whenever God spoke to Abraham, Abraham believed it. Right? Now God says, and, and, and as Abraham journeys along, God is constantly giving him more insight into the promise. He's bringing more information along. At first he says, amen, thy seed shall possess the land. So now Abraham knows he's going to have a seed. He said, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So he knows he's going to have a seed, amen. But then now God comes along and says, out of your bowels shall come a seed. So now God, as, Moses, or as Abraham journeys along, God is giving him more insight into the promise, more revelation about what he's promised him. Can you see yourself in this journey? So now he knows, and the scripture says, this, I want you to catch this. And he believed the Lord in the Lord, and he counted to him for righteousness. He believed what God said, and God counted to him for righteousness. So what does he do next? Chapter 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. So now we know that, that this is the birth of Ishmael. This is how Ishmael comes about. But, but Abram already says he believed God. God says, no, out of your bowels shall come a seed. Not, not this Eliezer of Damascus, not your servant, not one born in your house, but one that comes out of your bowels. And he believed God, and God counted to him for righteousness. But now he comes to Sarah, and Sarah is now stuck in reasoning. And the reasoning is, God, it's obvious I'm not going to have a baby. Look at me. Look how old I'm out. God hasn't allowed it. So now the next best thing that's legal and appropriate in our generation is to take my handmaid and raise up children unto me by that. And Abraham says, okay, that sounds reasonable. And Abraham, going into Hagar, is never doubting or disbelieving God. He believed God, but he's using his own reasoning to bring about the promise. They're using their own strength. They're using their own ideas to fulfill the word of God. And God has to break Abraham of this kind of thinking. So God allows an Ishmael to come on the scene. Let's go to chapter 17. When, when Ishmael comes on the scene, God doesn't strike Abraham dead. See, in all of this walk, Abraham was believing God. But he was believing God as a babe that was growing. And God was working with Abraham to grow him and to move him into position. God didn't strike him dead every time he disobeyed. 
When he went from Ur to Haran with his dad and Lot and everything, God didn't strike him dead. God just made sure Terah passed off the scene. So Abraham said, okay, now it's time to go. He goes, but Lot comes along. God doesn't strike him dead. When he gets in the law, into the land, God shows himself to him and confirms the promise again. What's he doing? He's growing Abraham. He's molding Abraham. He's bringing Abraham into the promise. If God can do that for Abraham, can he do it for you and I, friends? Can, when we started on this journey, we believed the word of God, but we did a lot of immature things, but we believed the word of God. We believed he was our healer. We believed the delivery. We believed he sent Malachi 4, amen, to bring us out of denominationalism. We believed, amen, that he was bringing us to a rapture. We believed these things. And we did a lot of immature things, but he never threw us away because he couldn't throw away his own elect. Amen. He couldn't change the promise. He has to work with the elect and work in the promise and bring us into position to fulfill the word. What has God been doing with us all these years? He's been doing the same thing he did to Abraham. Have any of you made a step to the right in Egypt? And God brought you back? And maybe even had a reward afterwards? Still blessed? Have you ever made a step to the left and God brought you back? God didn't choose you because of your actions. He chose you because of predestination. God will not throw you away because of your actions. You may suffer from them, but God will not throw you away because of predestination. Amen. Amen. It's not, this is not legalism. This is not good conduct then reward. God is looking at who believes me and who believes my word. God is the master of circumstances. He can arrange things to where separation will come. God can set up the circumstances where you'll make the right choice. (laughs) I don't know if you've ever been there. I've been there before. Amen. All of a sudden, you've got 10 options, and by the time it's done, you only have one more option. Has that ever happened to you? What was happening? God's watching over his word. God's bringing his promise to pass. God will not lose one. Genesis 17, 15. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarai thy wife, Thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old and Sarah that is ninety years old? And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. God's going to bring the promise about anyhow. Amen? Amen? And every stage of the journey, God is giving Abraham clearer understanding of the promise. First, you're going to be a mighty nation. Next, the seed's going to come out of you. Well, then we have, Ish- we have Ishmael. No, it's going to come through Sarah. At every stage of the journey, God is bringing a little more revelation about he's not changing his word. He's bringing a greater understanding of the original promise. How many of you see the message clearer than you saw it 40 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years? He never changed the message. He's given you clearer revelation of his message. Things that we thought, we don't think those ways anymore. What we thought was a right interpretation, we've given those things up. What we thought was right conduct, we've turned from those things. Why? Because all along the journey, God has guided us and turned us. And every every step along the journey, he's giving us more revelation on the original promise. He's not changing the message, he's opening more of it for us to see. With Abraham, he wasn't changing the message, he was opening more of the message for Abraham to see. And every time God opened more of the message, Abraham believed it. Lo and behold, the faith that he had originally was the faith that he had all along the journey. The faith the first believers call was the faith that he had that Sarah was gonna have a child. Is that right? Praise be to God. So if Abraham had the same faith 
to believe the promise originally, and the same faith to believe that Isaac will come through Sarah, what's changing? Abraham's changing. You and I have the same faith that we had to believe this message originally. That was the faith of God. That was a seed of faith by grace. We still have the same faith to believe the message the way we believe it now. What's changed? We've changed. Praise God. Amen. Let's look at, no, I don't want to look at this. Let's go somewhere else. We know that later, let's go to chapter 21. We'll look at chapter 21, verse 1. Genesis 21 and 1. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Listen, God keeps his word. Abraham and Sarah had no ability in themselves to bring about the promise of God. The only thing they could do was believe God every time God revealed more of the word to them. All they could do was believe it and accept it. They had no power to do anything. But when it was time for God to fulfill his promise, God visited Sarah according to his word, according to the time of life. And then Sarah conceived and brought forth a son. See, there's promises in our lives, but we have no power to produce them. There's times that that we get stuck in a devil's trap of thinking things aren't happening in our lives because somehow there's something wrong with us. We're wrong somewhere, we have to do a better job, we're not committed enough. I mean, and I'll tell you the truth, here's the truth, if you wanna know the real truth, you're not committed enough. I'm not committed enough. And you know what else? You're not sincere enough. And you're not dedicated enough. So when the devil brings that, there's no way that you're ever going to be committed enough to get God to do something for you or sincere. And the prophet was told you must be more sincere. That's true. We must be more sincere. But when you become more sincere, you'll need to be more sincere yet. Do you need to do a better job? You need to do a better job. (laughs) Should you be more faithful? You should be more faithful. Hey, we agree. When the devil comes and says you need to be more committed, just say, you're right. I need to be. But that's not going to change the way God views me or my faith in God or God keeping his promise. He, he is not waiting on me, amen, to, to do something of my own will and my own strength. He's waiting for me to believe him and then follow through with what I see and walk in what he's led me to walk in. Amen. There's things that I don't see yet. How will I see it until he opens it? There are things we don't understand yet. How are we going to understand it until God opens it? It takes divine revelation. You don't get divine revelation by hours of reading. But should you read? You should read. Should you read more? You should read more. You don't read the message enough. (laughs) You don't listen to enough tapes. See, you can preach that in a way where everybody walks out of here feeling guilty that we haven't taken the rapture yet because I don't pray enough, I don't read enough ta- listen to enough tapes, I don't read enough messages, I'm not consecrated enough or sincere enough. What could Abraham do to produce a baby? What could Sarah do to produce a baby? There's nothing they could do. Did Abraham need to be more sincere? Yes. <laughs> Did Abraham need to be more obedient? Absolutely, without question. Do you need to do more of the same? Yes. But until God opens it, until God changes it, what are you gonna do? This is not, we're not playing a merit badge system with God. Amen, you get so many points and then I'll release a promise to you. If you come to church all the time, don't miss communion, pay all your tithes, and you raise your children right, I'm gonna heal you. 
If we had to live in that setup, amen, we would be the most discouraged people in the world. But we live in a totally different kind of setup from God where God says, I already have a plan for you. I foresaw, I will bring it to pass. Amen. All I'm asking you to do is surrender to me as I reveal myself to you. Believe me. All these things are had by faith. When God brings it, believe him. Abraham believed God. At what point did Abraham not believe God? We would look back and see what Abraham did and said, that's mistakes. It is mistakes. Going to Egypt, mistake. Taking Lot along, mistake. Going to Haran with his dad, mistake. Mistake, 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 mistake. What did it change? Did it change anything in the purpose of God or who he was or what God's plan was? I'll ask you this, did God work with all of his mistakes? He allowed his mistake in Egypt to foreshadow his seed coming down into Egypt. Because when his seed goes down into Egypt, when, when, when Abraham goes into Egypt, he goes into Egypt because what? Because there's a famine in the land. When the children of Israel come to Egypt, why did they come to Egypt? Because there's a famine in the land. Huh. When he goes to Pharaoh, when it's time for Abraham to leave, when God wants Abraham to leave, he lets plagues break out in Pharaoh's house. When it's time for the children of Israel to leave, he allows plagues to break out in Pharaoh's house. That's curious. And when Abraham leaves, he leaves wealthy. When the children of Israel leave, they leave wealthy. Is God, you're saying God is even in his mistake? And God is even using his mistake? Absolutely, God is in every part of our lives. God will allow you to stub your toe so that you know that it hurts to kick that rock. I'm talking natural, but it's spiritual too. God will allow us to make spiritual mistakes to realize that his way is the only way. His path is the only one that works. Amen. God subjected us to this life. Amen. We're in the world, but not of the world, but we suffer the, the same with the same things the world suffers with. If not, you wouldn't get cataracts, need glasses, have braces, get a heart stent, take an ibuprofen. But we're here struggling with faith, <laughs> believing who we are and that God's got a plan in our lives. And through it all, he's healing, delivering, guiding. He's doing something in my life. I'm here for a purpose. That's the difference. We make mistakes, can God work with your mistakes? God can work with your mistakes. I've said many, many times, Abraham goes down to Gerar after the body change. You would think everything would be perfect, you know? But he goes to Gerar, amen, and still they keep this old lie that Sarah's my sister, and, and we know all that happens down there with the Abimelech, and he goes out of there, amen, and, and it's kind of a shameful thing, it's kind of disgraceful that Abraham would do this twice. But you know, that is the only scripture in all the Bible that a prophet can pick up 4,000 years later and say, see, they received a body change at the visitation of God. So can God even work with mistakes? God can even work with mistakes. The key is to have the faith of Abraham and believe God's called me. God will do what he said he will do. Do better. Okay, I'll do better. I want to do better. Is there anybody here who doesn't want to be more sincere? Raise your hand and then we'll have an altar call. Does anybody here not want to try hard? Anybody here not to want to be more obedient? We all want the same thing, friends, but it's going to take God guiding us. There's still things we're blind to. There's still things we're going in the wrong direction. There's still things he needs to open to us. But if we could look back at our life, we could have absolute confidence that God who first called me and first brought the message to me has never forsaken me through all of my ups and downs, all of my sidesteps. He keeps moving me along. And as he moves me along, he does the same thing for me he did for Abraham. He keeps opening up more of his plan to me and I see it more clearly oh I will be a seed but it's not going to be my servant it'll come from me oh it'll come from me but it'll come through Sarah every step he's learning more thanks be to God let's look at Romans chapter 4 keep your place in Genesis we're going to come back to that Romans chapter 4 
and verse 17. Romans chapter 4, verse 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God who quickened the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. So shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that, that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Thank God for the Romans account. And for the account in Hebrews. The Romans account was, he was not weak in faith. Well, what was this deal with Ishmael? I don't know, but he wasn't weak in faith. What was this deal with Lot? I don't know, but he wasn't weak in faith. All along, he was growing stronger in faith, not growing weak in faith, growing stronger in faith, believing the promise more, becoming more sure of God, becoming more confident in God's plan. And Abraham is starting to give up his own ideas and just take God at his word. Brother Branham said in the message, have faith in God. He said, my subject is have faith in God. Now, we are taught in God's blessed word that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word or the, of the word. Now, faith is also an experience. And many times faith is had by a former experience makes faith grow. Faith being the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So many people fail to find the real meaning of what faith is. Some people believe that faith is some sensation or some emotion, but, but the Bible said that faith is the substance of things hoped for. Brother Bram is telling us that many times faith, he said many times faith is had by a former experience that makes faith grow. Why have we gone through all the things we've gone through? So that we can learn to trust in faith and not in ourselves. Let's go to Genesis 22. And I want to look at Abraham's great test. This is a very, very, very familiar story. But to me, when I look at this test, when he takes Isaac on Mount Moriah, I see a man who has come to perfect faith and confidence in the promise of God. You look back on what Abraham did and how Abraham obeyed or partially obeyed or, or got in Egypt, got to Gerir, had Ishmael. You look at all of these things and you see a man who is believing God all the way, but he's going to right, to the left, to the right, to the left. But God is bringing him through all of that. And you come to Genesis 22 and you find a man who's entered into a level of maturity that I say is a goal or a target for us. This is in Genesis 22, 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. Let's go down to verse 4. Or no, I'm sorry, verse 1 again. Or verse 2, sorry. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains that I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. Now, listen, this makes no logical sense. God had promised Abraham his seed. The promise at the beginning was attached to Abraham's seed. God kept confirming the promise of a seed and a land, a seed and a land. And he kept revealing that seed until finally he gave a revelation of Sarah and Isaac, and Isaac the promised seed. And now God comes along to tempt or to test Abraham. And in Abraham's test, he would take the very thing that Abraham has believed in all along, the very culmination of all of his faith and all of his experiences, he would tell him to take that. Now take that thing that is the product of thy faith and the thing you've been pointed to all your life and slay it. It makes zero logical sense. 
But Abraham has come to the place where he is not trusting in logical sense anymore. He has learned to take God at his word. This is not, I'd say, this is the same man, but this is not the same man that went with his father to Haran and took Lot to the promised land. This is not the same man that went to Egypt. This is not the same man that went to Gerar. This is not the same man that took Hagar and raised up Ishmael. He's the same, but something has changed in Abraham. Abraham has learned something in his journey. Look at verse 4. I don't want to go to verse 4 yet. I want to look at Abraham. He now is asked to do something that he absolutely cannot explain. I mean, we thought it took faith before to live the life Abraham lived. This is going to take a whole other level of faith. But Abraham doesn't argue with God. He doesn't ask for an alternative course of action. Is that Abraham gets up, saddles his ass, takes the, the two young servants, takes Isaac, takes wood, takes fire, takes a knife, and starts moving. I say, God, bring us to this kind of faith. Verse 4. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. We've talked about this scripture so many times, but this is a proclamation of Abraham's faith in the promise of God because Abraham is not disbelieving or doubting God one iota and neither is Abraham reasoning in a way, but Abraham knows that God said, in Isaac shall thy seed be called, that this is Isaac, it has to be Isaac. He's come to the place to have confidence in God's word and not to mix it with his own plan. Now he's not trying to find a way to save Isaac. He's not even intent on saving Isaac. We know because Hebrews tells us that he was determined to slay Isaac. He is not coming up with an alternative plan. He is taking God at his word. So now he's got two words that look like they contra- they're contradictory to one another. Slay thy son, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So now he's going up to Moriah to do what God told him to do, to slay Isaac. Amen. But, but when he goes to Moriah and when he leaves the two young men, he says, you stay here. The lad and I will go worship and come again to you. Who's going to go worship? The lad and I. Who's going to come again? The lad and I. Hold your place here and turn to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. Hebrews eleven seventeen. By faith, Abraham, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Abraham's mind was not on getting out of this. Abraham was not working an alternative plan. Abraham believed God's word so much that if God asked him to kill the very product of the promise, he believed that God was able to raise him from the dead in the way that he had received him in a type. Abraham was so sure of God, he wasn't now, because God told him to go and offer Isaac as an sacrifice, he wasn't then going, well, maybe Isaac isn't the one. Maybe I misunderstood God. No, he heard God right. He knew Isaac was the one. So Hebrews tells us that what was going on in Abraham's mind was that Abraham said, this is the one, this is the word of God. Now Abraham is not adding anything to the word of God. He won't manhandle it anymore. Before he would manhandle it, he would say, now you go into the promised land and you stay in the land where I told you of. This is what Brother Bram tells us. But he says, but surely God wouldn't let me stay here when there's a famine. God would understand. I got to go and eat. That's manhandling the word. 
He says, out of your bowels shall come your seed. And then Sarah comes up with this plan, you know, Hagar, and it's legal. And he said, yeah, I, I agree with you. And it would still be coming out of my bowels. That's still the word. Okay, we'll go with this plan. Amen. Which was not the plan of God, but he went with that plan anyways. What was he doing? He was adding his own interpretation to the word. And it produced an Ishmael. But now we get to this time, and this is the hardest test of all, harder than leaving kinfolk, harder than leaving country, harder, amen, than staying in a land that's under famine. This is the hardest test of all, but this is why Abraham is the father of the faith, because he's come to a perfect faith. Slay the very product of the promise. If that's what you want, that's what I'll do. Come on, son, let's go. Let's go. What's he thinking? I don't know exactly what he's thinking, but Hebrews tells us he had thoughts. And he was thinking God's able to raise him back up. So that means Abraham was fully intent in obeying the word of God. But he never doubted the original promise. What an impossible situation intellectually. God is got Abraham to a point where Abraham's just going to obey and not mix any reasoning into his obedience. Let's go back to Genesis 22. 22 and 6. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Amen. I, I believe it like this, like Brother... Uh, Marcus was saying about the manifestation of the third pool, you'll say something and not even know what you're saying. We know by Hebrews, this is not the plan Abraham was thinking. Abraham was not thinking God will provide another lamb. Abraham was thinking God can raise him up. But when his son asked him the question, it wasn't Abraham's thinking, but something came out of Abraham's mouth. And what came out of Abraham's mouth was the spoken word. And in the walking in obedience, walking in perfect obedience, there was a need. Uh, Abraham had his own thought on how God will work the plan, but he wasn't doubting the word. But yet he had his own thought on how God will do this. But as they're walking along, uh, Isaac asked a question, Father the wood, Father the fire, where is the lamb? He said, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And that is exactly what God did, showing that Abraham was speaking the word of God. Amen. This was the third pull. This was the spoken word. When did it come? It came when he was walking in obedience to God without questions. And it wasn't Abraham's thinking. It just came out of Abraham's mouth. God will provide himself a burnt offering. Verse 9 and they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham, Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abram, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou has not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up, his, lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. God saw God knew the obedience of the man, and God provided a plan. Abraham, this time, did not have to come up with his own plan. Abraham, this time, did not have to figure it out on his own. He didn't compromise it. He didn't sidestep it. He didn't manhandle it. He just obeyed it, and God supernaturally provided what Abraham needed so Abraham could keep the word. When Abraham spoke, 
Brother Branham said, he said they were up there gathering stones for an altar. They looked all over the place on that mountaintop. There was no ram there. He said, God created a ram by Abraham's spoken word. Why did God create a ram? Because God had already given a promise to Abraham and God is not going to change the promise. God is going to keep the promise. He was just testing Abraham and now he finally got Abraham to the place that Abraham was supposed to be. But I tell you friends, where Abraham was is exactly where God foresaw him to be. That's where God led him all along. I believe with all my heart this bride is going to get to the same kind of faith. Where she doesn't question, she doesn't reason, she doesn't sidestep, figure another plan, leave in a time of famine, take extras along. She's just going to do exactly what he said, and she's going to believe that somehow he'll work it out. How's he going to work it out? You know, Abraham had to give up so much to go to Mount Moriah. He had to give up his emotions. His thoughts, his desires, his son, his reputation. Amen. Brother Benham tells us all the time about, Mo, about Abraham telling everybody, I'm going to have a son. And they laughed at him and they mocked him. Hey, father of nations, where's your son at? And now the fulfillment of the promise comes. Abraham is vindicated. Abraham is justified. And God tells him to take that very thing and slay it. He's giving up everything to keep the word of God. And in the line of duty, God provides this power of the spoken word and a supernatural ram to take his place. We want to see supernatural things, but we're still trying to go to Egypt to get bread. We want to see supernatural things, but we're still coming up with Hagar plans to bring about. If we want to see God work supernaturally, we've got to stick with God's word. And let God be responsible for keeping his word. Abraham now is not feeling responsible to bring the promise to pass. Abraham is past all of that. I said, God, help me get past all of that. I don't want to have to feel responsible, amen, for healing somebody's body. You're the only healer that there is. I don't want to feel responsible, amen, for trying to make the promise work out and make things the way you said they would be. I just want to trust in you and you work those out. I want to get beyond those things and I want to come to the place where we don't have to take care of those things. God will take care of them. All I got to do is stand on his word and say, God, you said, I don't know what else to do. Elijah, he could do everything God told him to do on Mount Carmel. I mean, he could, he could slay the animal. He could put the, word in order, or the, the, the wood in order. He could slay the beast. He could cover it all with water. He could do everything like he saw the vision do, but he could never make that fire come down from heaven. That was up to God. And all he could do was say, God, I've done this. I've done all of this at thy bidding. And then he had to wait. Moses, when he took the rod, amen, God told him, cast that rod down. Now take it up. It became a serpent, and then it became back to a stick. He goes and cast it down, and now Janus and Jambres, they throw down their rods. There's nothing else Moses could do. He couldn't pretend. He couldn't come up with plan B. He couldn't make excuses for them having snakes. All he could do was, Brother Bram said, he did what God told him to do. All he could do is stand by and wait for God. And what God did is allowed his snake to swallow up the other two and he picked it up and he had his rod plus their rods. Abraham couldn't do that. All Abraham could do was keep the word. Listen, there's a multitude of things that you and I can't do. I mean, if we just sit down together and we started listing them, heal your body, save your children. I mean, what else do we want to list? What is it we can't do? But the one thing we can do is by his grace, we can say amen to the word and say, God, line me to that word and I'm going to obey it. Amen. Not any extra thinking, not any extra plan, but I'll just take you at your word. And if I take you at your word, it's no longer my responsibility. Now it's your responsibility. Abraham is walking along with the promised son, going to kill the promised son. He's got a dilemma, but he, he, he's not going to worry about it. He's just going to do it. And his son asks him, what about, this land? what about this sacrifice? He said, God will provide us a sacrifice. No, that's not what he said. God will provide himself a sacrifice. God's the one who gave the promise. God's the one who has to keep the promise. 
Listen, we didn't make up the message. That was from the, the mind of God. It is the word of God. We don't have to keep it. God will keep it. We don't have to bring it to pass. We have to believe it and walk in it, and he'll keep it, amen? God will provide for himself everything that he needs to bring his purpose to pass. It's not up to us. It's up to us to receive it, to believe it, and to obey it. It's up to God to take care of the rest. And if you're having trouble obeying it, he knows how to move you because he won't lose you. Now let's look at verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemy and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. Listen, God, after Abraham did this action, this obedience on Mount Moriah, God come down supernaturally and confirmed it again and said, because you obeyed my voice, I this, I this, I this, and I this. Amen. Listen, that was not a new covenant. That was not a new promise. God was reconfirming the old promise. Nothing changed in the mind of God. God wasn't waiting for Abraham to obey. God was, just, God was blessing Abraham for his obedience and said, I swore of myself, I will do this, I will do this, I will do this, and I will do this. God was so pleased with Abraham, he was once again confirming his promise. But it wasn't a new promise. It was the original promise. Brother Branham says in the message expectation, he said, now we find out that the child never arrived until 25 years later. But instead of growing weak because it never happened the first month, he grew stronger all the time. Because his expectation was greater. If Sarah was one month older, it'd be one month greater in the expectations because God kept his word. It would be a lot better for her to have the child at 100 years old than it was at 60 years old. See what I mean? It was a greater miracle all the time. And he never grew weak, but he grew stronger all the time. Now we are the children of Abraham. The Bible said so. We being dead in Christ take on Abraham's seed and are heirs according to the promise. We are heirs of the promise with Abraham because Abraham was given the promise. Now, if we are his heirs with Abraham, then we are Abraham's children. And the same faith that Abraham have, we have ourselves. That when God makes a promise, just know it's going to happen. It can't do anything else. And the message possessing, the, thy seed shall possess the gate of the enemy. You go through a test. God tests you like he did Abraham. He tests Abraham's seed after him. And now the reason we don't possess the gate of the enemy, the reason there's so much among us is because that we're not able to stand the test. And let me tell you something, the test of the word is right. He goes on further in the same message, he says, now Abraham, the promise is made to Abraham and to a seed after him. Now God give his promise to Abraham of his seed would possess the gate of his enemy after he had tried Abraham, tested Abraham. Now after the testing comes, Abraham had already been converted, we would call it, from paganism unto God. And then God had given him a sign of the Holy Ghost, the circumcision. Then after the circumcision, then come the testing time. Listen, if it happened to Abraham, it'll happen to us. God's going to test us. What's he looking for? He's looking for perfect faith. He's looking for somebody that, that has walked with God, that God's led, that God's established in the truth, that'll just say, God, you said it. I don't know how you'll work it out, but I'm trusting in you. I... We, we come to this position where we were going to have somebody in our family tested for COVID, and I, I knew what that means. I know if it's a positive test, then there's quarantines and difficulties and difficulties for everybody else. But I, I finally got to the place where I said, God, it is what it is. I'm in your hands. You know, I've got a trip coming up to Uganda. I want to make sure for the sake of Brother Abraham and his family that, that we're there. I want to do all that I can. 
But at the end of the day, it has to be God. I can only do so much. I want to be here faithful in my post of duty to preach when it's my time to preach and to do what God's called me to do. But there's only so much I can do. It already was what it was. I could act like an ostrich and stick my head in the sand and say everything's fine, but that's not really honest. But I could commit myself to God and say, God, it is what it is, and I'm trusting in you. I want to stay in my post of duty. I want to go to Uganda. I want to do what you've called me to do. But God, if you have another plan, then it's up to you. I can't change anything. It is what it is. And I tell you, friends, that's not the way I was five, six, seven, eight years ago. I would have tried to think, well, if I don't know, I could answer this way. And, and you were the same way. <laughs> we're in this boat together. Years ago, I would have tried to say, but for the ministry's sake, and because of this, and because of that, I need to make sure this, and, I need, and, and, and it's better not to know. Listen, I'm not going to go get a test every time I sneeze. But if I've got a real concern, if there's a real issue and God puts it on my heart, then I need to be honest and responsible. I told my wife, there's six of us in the family. If we stayed home every time somebody sneezed and coughed, then forget, see, I'll see you guys in a couple years. I mean, it's not going to happen. That's not what I'm talking about, but I'm talking about when you lose your sense of taste and you say, I had a stupid COVID, I don't care. God will take care of me. I'm going to the fellowship anyways. That's not faith, friends. That's not integrity. That's not honesty. That's just not right. It's a bravado. It's a brashness that is rooted more in fear than in faith, more in pride than in faith. But God allows these things. We can't change them. What can you do about it? At some point, you say, God, I'm in your hands. If you allow it, you allow it, and I'll trust that it's right. I can't see how it's right. I feel like I'm supposed to do this, I'm supposed to do this, but it's up to you. We, you know, for me, I made that decision so easy. How did I make that decision so easy? Because two years ago, it was a really hard decision to make. We think COVID's of the devil. God allowed it. There's things that he's working out of us. And when this one's done, another something will come. May not be a sickness, may not be this. It may be something, it may be a financial disaster. It may, it may be a natural disaster. Who knows what it'll be. But God is perfecting the faith in his bride until she quits trying to take care of herself. She quits playing games. She quits going to Egypt. She quits taking a long lot. She stops having Hagar until she finally gets the place to say, Lord, I'm standing here. You're God. I'm here. What you want is what I want. What you allow, I accept. What you change, only you can change it. I can't change it. I think God is bringing us to maturity, friends, so that the faith that's in us becomes the thing that dominates our lives. A real faith, a steady faith, a solid faith, not a bravado, not an not a arrogance, not a pride, not a spitting at the devil. That you can't, listen, you can't spit on the devil. He's a spirit. He's invisible. You can't spit on him. You can't stomp on his head. He doesn't have a physical head for you to stomp on. Amen. At some point, you have to say, God's in control. I believe the word of God, and God, I'm taking you at your word, and I'm trusting you to do what only you can do. At some point, you have to say, God, I'm in your hands, not mine. If you don't protect me, I'm not protected. If you don't feed me, I'm not fed. If you, don't, if you don't provide for me, then I'll go without. But I can't, I can't make my own mind. I'll just follow your word and trust in you. I'm not going to take care of myself anymore with my own intellect. I'm going to stand on your word and watch you keep your word. The bride has got to come to a higher level of faith. And that higher level of faith is not, not I mean, look at Abraham when he comes to the perfection of faith. He's not casting mountains into the sea. God says, slay your son. 
he gets up and starts packing a donkey. Come on, son. What are you going to do? We're going to go kill my son. What is this? This is perfect faith. But, but isn't he the one that God told you that the seed, your seed shall be in Isaac? And Isaac shall their seed be called? Yeah, he's the one. What do you think? Maybe God has changed his mind or something. No, he's the one. Then what are you going to do? I'm going to go kill him. But you said he's the one. How do you reconcile these two thoughts? It's not up to me to reconcile these two thoughts. It's up to me to obey the word of God. God will reconcile these two thoughts. Come on, let's go. Dad, what are we doing? We're going to make a sacrifice. Where's the lamb? God will provide for himself a lamb. And that became the spoken word that created a created lamb. This to me, this is just me, this to me is perfect faith. It wasn't a public show. It didn't bring any kind of accolades or merits to Abraham. It wasn't there to prove anything to anybody else. It was Abraham alone with his son on a mountaintop and God did the supernatural because he believed his word. To me, this is perfect faith. And when I read this story, I can see myself all the way through. I can see the missteps, I can see the immaturity, I can see the wrong idea about how the word will be accomplished. I can see, I can see, when you look back at Abraham, I can see myself, friends. Abraham had a few, I have multitudes of those stories. But I said, God, if you can bring me this far, would you bring me to this kind of perfect faith where I can just humbly follow after you and watch you do the supernatural and watch you do what I can't do? Can we finally come to the place where we have confidence in God and just in God? Are we always going to be mixing this confidence in God with confidence in ourselves? Say, it's time to say, humanly, naturally, physically, I can't do it. But if I'll just keep believing him and keep stepping where he says step and keep walking where he says walk, he'll do everything he promised to do. What a journey we're on, friends. For me, this is just me, I feel God saying, grow up, Chad. It's time to quit acting childish. Time to quit shaking your fist at the world and just trust in the word of God. It's not, you know, it's not even our job to explain everything. We can't explain everything in the message. It's not our job to defend the message. We can't defend the message. It's not our job to make everybody see. We can't make everybody see. What can we do? We can, be, we can believe what God shows us and act accordingly. And if we can keep believing what God shows us and acting accordingly, he'll take care of the rest. And I just believe that more than I ever did before. I want to read this last quote, and as I read that, musicians, if you'd like to come, Brother John, if you'll make your way up. In the message, the God of this evil age, he says, we find now this evil age is to prove to Satan she is not like Eve, that she is not that type of woman, and she will be tried by his word, the bride, as Adam's bride was tried by the word. And Adam's bride believed every bit of the word, all but confused on one promise, that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, today, see, but failed on one promise under the temptation of the enemy face to face. And now the people that's called for his name, of course, is his bride. She is to come in contact again by the same thing, not by just denominational truth or something, but every word. Amen. Eve was tried. The first church age was tried. The nation of Israel was tried. Amen. This bride will be tried. She'll be tried by the word and she'll stand by the word. Not her own, not her own anything. She'll stand by the word. I mean, let's all stand. Let's say, God, make me faithful. Faith isn't what I used to think faith was. Faith, I used to think faith was like being really loud and screaming at the devil. I mean, I was raised Pentecostal, so I mean, forgive me. I started off as a baby. Uh, faith, faith for me was rhetoric. 
But I had a lot of strong rhetoric because down inside I had a little fear. And the more you're afraid, the louder your rhetoric becomes. But what I've experienced is the more faith I have, the quieter I get about things. The more I believe God's going to work it out, the less I fret over it, the less I talk about it, and the less I shout at the devil. I hope you understand what I'm saying. I want to have mature faith. I want to have a faith that's dependable, that doesn't leave me. It's not dependent on me working something out, but something that just solidly laying there said, he's taken care of me before, he'll take care of me again. He's called me for a purpose and nothing's gonna happen to me till his purpose is finished. Nothing can happen to me unless it first crosses his desk and I believe it and I'm going to accept what comes and believe that he'll bring me out of it all because the scripture says many are the afflictions of the righteous but he is the one that delivers them out of them all. So I just believe God, and I want to believe him more. And I say, God, give us this kind of faith that Abraham had, and I believe that's the kind of faith he's bringing us to, friends. Say, when we look back and say, yep, I did that, and I did that, and I did that, but he brought me back out of that. He, he brought me through that. He brought me to where I am today, and I'm going to look forward and say, God, you've kept me there. You'll keep me here. I'm going to keep walking and trusting in you. Amen. These things that are happening in the world, they're only there to perfect the bride. All of these things that we face and all the things that are going on, I mean, if you watch the news, you can see all kinds of things are happening everywhere. I just found out that there's like five or six nations that they're shutting down travel to the southern part of Africa. And they stopped in Malawi and Mozambique. Guess what's just above Malawi and Mozambique? Uganda. <laughs> What can you do about it? I can scream at the devil, but God's in control. I'll tell you the thing that I want most is not to go to Uganda, it's to come home from Uganda. (laughs) I would like to have a guarantee that I'm coming home. (laughs) But I believe God called me there because of the circumstance and I believe he'll get me home. It's not a plane, it'll be a boat, be a train. But I believe I just trust in God. The world is in such a a, a chaos. You can make travel plans one day, they can be interrupted the next. You can be somewhere and borders could shut down. But you know what? When all of that happened before, God took care of everybody. And he'll do it again. We can't operate by fear. We have to trust in the Lord. If we are who we believe we are, and he is who we believe he is, then we have to act like it. I say, for me, it's time to grow up and start acting like it. Quit running around when things happen. It's time to quiet down and say, all is well. All is well. Everything is under control. I'm trusting in God. Man, let's bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the privilege, Lord, of gathering together. We thank you, God, for your word and for the picture that you painted for us in your word. God, I thank you personally. I thank you for the life of Abraham. I thank you, God, that you wrote everything in the Bible the way you wrote it so that I could see a true picture. Because if all I had was an account in Hebrews, I wouldn't understand how you could work with me. But because you wrote it out in the book of Genesis and showed us the missteps, the the wrong thinking, the wrong actions, Lord, I've got more confidence than ever that what you did for brother Abraham, you can do for me. He's the father of the faith. By faith, I'm a seed of Abraham. The way you guided him, you can guide me, Lord. I'm so thankful for your word. I pray, God, that you would just purge out of me all of the the selfishness, Lord, all of the self-preservation, all of the wrong ideas and wrong concept, purge it out of me, Lord. And let me just see myself in your hand. In every circumstance, I'm in your hand. Through every trial, I'm in your hand, Lord. Everything that comes and goes, I'm in your hand. Lord, let me have confidence in that and quit Lord, acting and reacting in the flesh, but Lord, let me stay spiritual and see that you're in control of it all. God, these times have been hard, 
But God, worse times are coming. God, train us through these things to be able to stand in these hours of temptation and trial. May we stand with your word and your word alone. No human effort, no human reasoning, no human strength, no will of our own, no self-preservation. But let us just stand and say, God, I trust you here. Show yourself mighty on our behalf again. We love you, Lord. We commit ourselves into your hands. We thank you for your provision and how you've protected us and taken care of us through it all. We ask that you would bless us as we go from here. May we walk on this earth in confidence, Lord, that you're watching over us like you watched over Abraham. And every step we take is not outside of your sight. And when needed, you'll come down and you'll move things along like you did for Abraham. Let us walk forward with this confidence and this joy in our hearts that all is well and you're working your plan and we're quickly coming to the finish line of that plan. Lord, manifest yourself through your bride in this last day. We commit ourselves into you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. And when we come to Genesis 22, for me what's on display greater than anything is preeminence. Who was having the preeminence in Genesis 22? God was having the preeminence. We know God's had a great plan in threefold. The threefold purpose is all about preeminence, preeminence in a man. He got that in Christ Jesus, preeminence in a people. He's getting that now. I say, God, have your preeminence in me. Man, God bless you. We love you. Brother John. I came to hear the word And with each line and phrase He was drawing me to give a heart Oh
the morning when I rise. In the morning when I Uh...